Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Coppinger Coal webinar with um, Thales uh, Security. Um, this, uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm Mike Small and I'm a senior after, uh, analyst with Coppinger Coal and I'll be talking with uh, Paul Hampton who is a product manager with uh, Thales uh, Security. Uh, and so the, the subject today is uh, securing your data or data protection in the cloud. And this is a very uh, Im important and apposite subject at the moment, uh, it, which is it's surprising that over 10 years uh, we've had cloud services. Uh, and in the beginning, people were told that these were going to completely replace the existing on-premises services. And there is no doubt that a lot of organizations are using particularly software as a service for things like CRM and for um, office productivity. However, the workloads that were on premises mainly remain on premises and only something like 20% have been moved. And the reason uh, that is given for this is because of concerns over compliance and security. So the question is, um, what, what is holding things back and what do we need to do about it? So I think I'll start off by asking Paul, what, what's different between securing data uh, on premises and securing data in the cloud? Hello, Mike. It's good to talk to you again. So uh, from my perspective, the, the, the big difference with securing data within the cloud is that you can't implicitly rely on uh, the, uh, the fact that your information cannot be accessed by uh, another party. It is not within your data center. It is no longer within uh, your own personal IT infrastructure. And it is moving to a essentially a, a shared infrastructure. And so that means for organizations who've typically relied on the fact that they have private data centers, they have their own uh, private computing infrastructure, they cannot rely on just that, um, I suppose, uh, sole use angle uh, for protection of their data. They now need to accept that they're running essentially on somebody else's computer. Uh, and that means that they need to be applying other controls beyond it's on a computer behind a locked door uh, to their data. And really, that needs to start with uh, a knowledge of what exactly the data is uh, and what does it do, where does it reside. And for many organizations, certainly organizations uh, we talk to, a lot of the time that is very much the first but also the most difficult challenge. It's not necessarily securing the data, it's first identifying the data that you have, assigning a sensitivity to it, and then picking what are appropriate controls for that data. And so when we look at cloud infrastructures, the cloud providers will give a variety of different security levels that you might choose to employ. Knowing what is right for you and what is right for your data is really key. And then as you move beyond that, you talked about those workloads that are still stubbornly on premise, let's say. Um, we have a whole series of challenges in terms of applying appropriate controls with that data. And often trying to work out suitable separation of duties such that the data holder, and in that case that is the cloud provider, uh, is uh, not given full control of the data. They, they may hold the data but not potentially the uh, keys to unlock that data. Ultimately though, the organization responsible for the data stays the same. It doesn't matter whether it's running uh, on premise or within a uh, cloud infrastructure. It is the organization that data belongs to who are ultimately responsible for its security. And so whilst quite a few things change and we can no longer rely on uh, just pure privacy or, or lack of uh, perimeter access as uh, a data control methodology, many things stay the same, including who owns that data. Yeah, I think that's uh, an important point because there is a lot of confusion because of this uh, 
shared responsibility model with the uh, with the cloud services and many people uh, kind of get the mistaken belief that if you put your workload and your data in the cloud that somehow or other the cloud provider is now going to take total responsibility for things yes and uh, indeed there is a complicated delivery stack and the sharing of responsibility depends upon the kind of service so for example with infrastructure as a service the 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 provider is only really responsible for everything up to the hypervisor um, and with uh, software as a service it's uh, everything up to the application level but the key thing across all of these different things is the responsibility for the data just like you highlighted that the customer always is responsible and they will be the ones that get hit by the regulators and so forth so is there a difference is there a difference between securing your own data uh, and uh, making sure that the the cloud service provider is securing things so for example they say things like well we'll we'll encrypt your data so what, 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 what would you say to that? So I think where cloud providers give a significant advantage and benefit to organizations, particularly maybe smaller and medium-sized organizations, mm-hmm. is they give you, let's say, out-of-the-box controls, uh, encryption options, for example, as you mentioned, uh, that you can very easily turn on. Now, that in and of itself is, of course, great some encryption is better than none however ultimately the cloud provider in many scenarios also holds the encryption keys and is uh, then holding the data and the keys and and all you're really doing with encryption is transferring risk from the data to the key and he holds the key controls the data and so the cloud provider I, i think in many cases will ease that transition from I'm not necessarily using encryption to protect my data to now I'm using encryption but where things then become extremely complicated I think and as an industry generally I don't think we're doing a particularly great job is control and management of the encryption keys and really all we've done is parcel the data up and transfer the risk to the encryption key. Yes it's certainly true that um, uh when you uh, when you look at data protection it's rather like a sponge that when you squeeze it in one direction what happens is the problem pops out somewhere else and so uh, you look at uh, symmetric cryptography where the problem is managing the keys and uh, when you go to public key cryptography it becomes uh, uh, having a trust in the 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 certificate and uh, the ownership of the private key so i think ultimately though we we have to look at risk and i think that was one of the key words that you mentioned there that organizations need to understand what the risks are and those risks that apply to them and to take control uh, in in relation to those risks and to use the right things. So, for example, encryption is only one of the possible controls, uh, and it only protects against certain kinds of uh, of of risks. And access control is another one. And I don't know what what would you say to organisations about looking at risk and what risks and controls are good for what circumstances. Uh, so uh, for me, that always starts with the data and classifying the data because not all data requires the same degree of protection. And to try and protect all data to the absolute highest standard almost becomes a, a self-defeating task for many organizations. Uh, and so uh, for me, you need to very much go through a, a strong and stringent data classification process to identify what is information that needs, let's say, very basic protection uh, and maybe just access controls, as you mentioned, uh, around that through to what is the information that is absolutely vital to the uh, survival of our organization and and the ongoing protection of both organization and customer. Uh, And getting that classification correct is really a uh, 
significant hurdle and an early challenge. Once you've done that, then you can look at what are the appropriate controls that I should apply for each individual uh, data category. And, and so for me, it's, it's that those series of steps along the way that uh, are really the key to solving what is otherwise quite a thorny problem. Yes, it's also true that um, <clears throat> in order to classify the data, you have to know that you have it. And one of the big yes. challenges uh, about today's world, and indeed this has been made much worse by our good friend COVID uh, is, uh, and working from home, is the enormous amount of data that is generated by the office workers, by the uh, road warriors, and by uh, the use of office productivity tools, email, and so forth. So what do you say about uh, all of uh, this kind of data? Are, are there tools that, that can help to find and classify that data? And how effective are they? So yes, there are absolutely uh, data discovery tools that look to automate the, the, the burden of finding that data. Um, uh, some of the tools are really good indeed. However, uh, like all tools, some of the um, I suppose nuance is down to the operator. So you mentioned road warriors and, and those of us who are, um, I suppose, uh, now, now uh, working from home with uh, uh, no end in sight. Uh, that data is not necessarily easily accessible to an organization. And uh, as we know, there's many ways of uh, sharing and communicating data and different cloud services devoted to that. And so for an organization to try and control a very uh, distributed workforce and make sure that all data is within uh, their oversight is extremely difficult indeed. So whilst, yes, there's great data discovery and classification tools um, available, and they really are, I think, something you'd absolutely use to do this, being certain that you've captured every last piece of data is uh, very much a challenge and something that is uh, a difficult thing to get right indeed. And uh, in addition to the, the, the data that you might know you have, there is this data that is perhaps being used in unexpected ways. And one of the, the there, there are two things that I always uh, think of. One is uh, journals and logs, that there's an awful amount of data that sort of sits around applications, journalizing transactions. And the other is data that is used for development purposes. And do you have any advice over those kinds of uh, data? So we've, yes, yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right. So we've got data and I, I suppose almost metadata as well, um, data about the data uh, and mm. uh, logs and, and, and journals are one example of that, I'd say. So uh, again, the, these things can be produced in huge volumes, which uh, can be its own challenge. And indeed, uh, it may well be produced in greater volumes if you use a cloud service than potentially were with the on-premise equivalent applications that you were running before. Uh, they're also potentially a whole lot more accessible uh, within a cloud service uh, for good and bad. So uh, protection of that data, and then you mentioned development data as well, that um, is certainly a challenge, particularly where you've got uh, development teams who may now uh, be remote when previously they'd have been on site who are working on particularly sensitive items, you know, high security source code, etc. Uh, and uh, providing a remote development environment that meets all of the, uh, I, I suppose, security controls and indeed compliance controls that might be required uh, is a new and fresh challenge that I know a lot of our customers are, are working through at the moment. You know, how do I have my most sensitive source code and development activities happen remotely? Uh, and whilst the, uh, I suppose, whilst cloud services can help to an extent and certainly provide you with a rich suite of tools for remote usage, uh, a lot of the classic IT security problems remain and all of the things that uh, I suppose something like ISO 27001 would tell us about how to go about securing data uh, still very much hold true, uh, but with a completely fresh set of challenges uh, without the, the physical security barriers that we've uh, often relied on maybe too heavily previously. Yes, well, so standards like ISO 27001 and so forth are, are extremely important, but they also leave an enormous amount of discretion uh, 
uh, to the yes, uh, the yes. applier of the the standard. So, for example, earlier on you talked about the need to secure keys. So there are different ways that people secure keys. There was uh, uh, public key infrastructure where you effectively have a. a, a, a uh, uh, two different keys and you also have things like hardware security modules so what is your advice and what what do you say to people about how best to deal with securing keys so as as referenced earlier that the key once you use encryption the key is equivalent to the data that whoever controls the key essentially controls the data and so the controls you put around that key have to be commensurate with the controls that you'd put on the data itself. Now, uh, you, you reference uh, certainly PKI and indeed the, there's a, a lot of really good crypto systems around for distributing and sharing keys. Ultimately though, all of them come back to a, a root of trust in some shape or form, be that the private key in a PKI infrastructure or indeed a, a master key in let's say a, a some sort of symmetric derivation scheme. Uh, ultimately, there is a, a single key. If that key is truly precious to your organization because the data it protects is precious, then uh, we, uh, so Talis, my employer, and indeed myself, would advocate that that key should be stored extremely strongly and protected extremely strongly. And typically, that leads you towards hardware security modules. If I look at cloud services generally, I think there's a number of different key management options that are available to anybody picking one of the popular public clouds, uh, be that local key management within the cloud or, or often uh, some form of uh, either customer sourced, bring your own encryption key, or uh, in some cases, a higher level, which is customer managed. Uh, the security that you need to apply to your data, I think drives how you look at that key management. And so for the most uh, secure use cases, you'd say hardware security module for things that let rest in the middle, potentially a, uh, a cloud provider's key vault is sufficient. And then at the lower end, you probably have, um, I suppose, much less scant controls around the uh, the, uh, the keys in question, potentially with software key stores protected by passwords if it is you know, low value data ultimately. Uh, and picking that um, picking that differentiator between the data, I think is, is really important. Uh, of course, if you want to just go best practice all the way through, my advice would be uh, put all your keys inside a hardware security module and that way you can be extremely confident that they are not going to be misused or indeed uh, go missing without your knowledge. Yeah, so, so again, this to some extent comes back to the risk that we're looking at, that if the cloud provider is managing the keys and holds the keys, then the risk is that the cloud provider potentially has access to your data. And the SHREM2 uh, rulings recently raised the anxiety of customers that a cloud provider may be subject to government pressure to disclose yes. data. So that is really the risk there. Now, the next level of risk is perhaps that the administrators within the cloud service provider may go rogue and decide to steal and sell your data. Beyond that, you're then looking at things like, well, what happens when the media or the space in the media that your data is held on is reused by some other uh, organization. So all of those things are, are areas where uh, encryption is really important and um, that uh, uh, managing the keys is, is, uh, is also important. Now, perhaps uh, in that you also spoke about um, all the various exotic ways that cloud providers talk about this, like bring your own key, yes. homomorphic encryption, double encryption. Would you, would you like to just expand a little bit on that? Yes, I, I can try. And I have to say, this is an extremely complicated space where there's a large number of buzzwords that arrived in very short order uh, that I think make it confusing and complicated for people coming fresh to uh, wanting to use a public cloud and trying to understand how on earth they handle encryption and key management in the space. So uh, 
I, I would give this answer in a sort of hierarchy of security for your keys from the cloud provider manages the keys, which as you touched on Mike, means there is no separation of duties between the people who hold the keys and the people who hold the data. And so that's sort of uh, base option one. You can then uh, have with most cloud providers some form of bring your own or customer sourced encryption key option. And in this scenario, the customer generates a encryption key that they wish the cloud provider to use and then typically securely uploads it to the cloud provider. So that still doesn't give you the separation of duties between who holds the key and who holds the data, but it does give you the assurance that the key is one that you have knowledge of and was created in line with your own organization's best practice. Uh, so you can be confident in the security and quality of the key uh, and indeed its origin, and you know that you also hold the key. Moving on from there to a third tier, we've then got uh, customer managed or external, uh, externally managed. Uh, oh, and you mentioned double key encryption also, which is uh, new from uh, one particular cloud provider. All of these uh, modes of operation mean that the, the cloud provider's customer holds the key and then carries out the encryption and decryption operations on behalf of the cloud provider when they're required. So for example, if a piece of data is being accessed within the cloud provider, uh, the cloud provider will make an outbound request to their customer to say, I need you to decrypt this data, please, or perform this particular crypto operation, a sign or a verify, for example. And in this scenario, you do get strong separation between the party holding the data and the party holding the key. And you can also therefore have a extremely strong audit layer. We mentioned audit and logging a few moments ago. You can have a, an extremely strong layer of uh, audit and knowledge as to why the cloud provider is requesting access to your data and when they are requesting access to that data via uh, access to the key. And so let's say uh, US Patriot Act and uh, a uh, uh, essentially a, a no-knock um, access to data by a government, you'd still see the cloud provider requesting access to the data, even though they couldn't tell you that they were operating under uh, a warrant and, and under government order. And so that gives, I, I suppose, the, uh, the fullest amount of security possible in this scenario where your data is resident in a cloud service. Well, this is a, an incredibly interesting and wide subject, and I'm sure we could talk about it all day. But um, since we don't actually have all day, perhaps you could uh, finish off by uh, saying, in this complicated world where you are using both on-premise and cloud services, what would your simple piece of advice to organizations be? I think... The, the simple advice and the first step is data classification, discovery and classification, because once you've solved that problem and you've identified the data that you have, at that point, choosing the correct controls to use becomes a, a much, much easier challenge. And so for me, it's all about discovering classification of data. Discover and classify your data and then use the appropriate controls. Well, thank you very much, Paul Hampton, Product Manager of uh, uh, Sally's uh, Security. And uh, thank you very much to the audience for listening. Thank you for your time, Mike. Thank you.